Uh, this is Karan El Rosari. I'm sorry, I just, I'm still a little tired. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna let her get on with her talk. All right. All right, guys. Okay, hopefully you can hear me okay like this? Yeah? How are you guys doing? Having a good DEF CON? Welcome to Sunday Afternoon, track one, also known as the after party track. Seeing that everybody has had a pretty wild weekend, I guess you guys might be hungover, but let me ask you, how many of you are here at DEF CON for the first time, actually? Wow, that is a lot of you guys. Well, give yourself a hand. You made it. You are no longer DEF CON virgins. All right. And the reason I, I bring that up is because this is actually my first time speaking at DEF CON. And I'm extremely excited and a little bit nervous, to be honest, to be with you here. But the reason I'm here is because I honestly, deeply, and firmly believe that hackers can have a positive impact on the world. That we can actually save the world for generations to come. Now, I know that sounds like a tall order, but I'm going to take you through it, and I hope by the end I'll make true believers out of you. My name is Keren El Azari. That is how you pronounce it. For those of you who find it difficult, you can find me online as Keren E. All the E's are spelled with three. Or also known as Special K in certain circles. Right. So, let's get the show on the road. A little bit about myself. I've been in the security industry for almost 15 years now. I've worked with a bunch of Fortune 500 companies, consulting firms, government agencies, think tanks, academic organizations, really all across the board. Doing stuff like network operations, security operations, product management, intelligence work. But that's not why I'm here today. I'm also on the advisory board of a pretty cool cryptocurrency startup called Epifide. For those of you who know the Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson, yes, the company is named after the one in the book. Thank you. <laughs> but again, that's not why I'm here today. Actually, this woman is the reason I'm here today. So that is Angelina Jolie, right? And she portrayed Acid Burn in the 95 film Hackers. I was 14 at the time, and I can see you doing the math, trying to figure out my age. I'm 33 now, so let me save you the trouble. It's Sunday, I know it's hard. <laughs> but when I saw this movie, I instantly realized that all of the stuff that I like doing was actually called being a hacker, and it's a thing, and girls can do it too. And hackers can be heroes if they want to. So that is why I'm here. Now I have a, another confession to make. Like I told you, this is my first time speaking in DEF CON. I've always wanted to speak here and I've actually been submitting talks for years and I could never get in. And then last year, something exceptional happened to me. I was invited to speak at a little place called TED. Those of you who are not familiar with the concept, it's a pretty high profile media conference where they also film the talks and put them online and then millions of people watch them. Naturally, I freaked out. I was also certain that I might get hacked for giving a TED talk about hackers. But then thankfully, I learned that Randall from XKCD was also going to be there. So I was relieved. I thought everybody's just gonna pay attention to his math and comics and his cool stuff and they're not gonna notice little old me. I also realized it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to use the TED platform to hack into people's minds, to get them to change the way they see hackers, the way they think about us, about this community that I've been a part of and that I believe can do positive things. So in order to make that change happen, I created a virus, a mental virus, an idea that would stick with people as they watch the talk and hopefully would propagate and spread onwards. And that idea was that hackers are actually a vital part of the world, that we are actually kind of like the immune system for the information age, and that it falls to us to find the vulnerabilities and force the world to fix them. Now, I didn't know how well this message might come across, and I'm humbled and overwhelmed and excited to admit, I think the virus worked. Because almost 800,000 people have watched it and shared it. And so apparently, 
outside of this conference, outside of this community, there is a willing audience ready to start looking at hackers differently, expecting us to start being those heroes. And so it's time for me to be here and come full circle with you guys and tell you about how we can be those heroes and how we can make that change happen. Now, I'm not a futurist, but I can offer one prediction with regards to the technology, our future, and cyberspace. We don't know what's coming around the corner. Technology is changing so fast. But if we leave our digital future, our civilian and government infrastructure, if we leave all of the technologies we rely on solely in the hands of governments and multinational corporates, guess what, guys? They will mess it up. Now, we can argue about the degree and the measure of failure that is going to happen, but based on past experience, there is no reason to expect things to be different, especially with the way certain governments are looking at cyberspace. So I think now is the time. Now is a transformative time in the history of technology, and it's the time for hackers to start making that positive impact. But in order to make that happen, we have to make a choice. We have to decide that we are willing to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So today, in order to make it easy for you to make the choice, I'm going to walk you through some of what I think are the biggest, thorniest, hairiest problems and why I think it does fall to hackers to fix these and that we can't leave it in the hands of governments. Now, let's start with what is perhaps the chunkiest problem of them all, and that is the cyber problem. I know cyber has been diluted to a drinking game, and I will happily have a drink later, but I think there is a good reason to talk about securing cyber space and not just information space or information technology. And in fact, I will also buy a drink to anyone who can tell me right now where the word cyber, or rather the prefix cyber, not the noun, not the verb, but the prefix cyber, where does that come from? Raise a hand, anyone over there? Yes? Yes, you are correct, madam, in fact. Very nice. I will buy you a drink later. So uh, the lady in purple mentioned that it has to do with the Greek origin, the Greek derivative. So let me give you kind of a very short history lesson about that. This guy, Professor Norbert Wiener, yeah, that's his real name. Uh, he's a math, he was a math professor here in the United States. And in 1948, he developed a new scientific discipline called cybernetics. He came up with it after he saw in World War II what new remote command, communication, and control technologies were doing. How radio has been transforming the battlefield, how the new concept of digital computers was influencing signal intelligence, and how new technologies being pushed out into the world are making a transformative change. And so to depict all of these different control and communication systems in the animal and the machine, that's the name of his book, he used the term cybernetics. He didn't even know about the type of technologies we're going to have right now, but he did borrow from the ancient Greeks, and rather for their term, for the guy running the boat. The guy commanding, controlling, and communicating orders. And that guy is maybe called in English a captain, but in Greek it is called kybernetas. And that is the source for cyber. And actually in my uh, home language of, of Hebrew, we still call the captain of a boat, but also the guy running the country, a kvarnit. And kvarnit comes from the same origins. And so we can make fun of cyber and whether it's a diluted f term or not, but cybernetic technologies, controlling and commanding stuff, this is what allows humankind to have freaking laser shooting robots running around on Mars, but also tweeting about it. <laughs> this is all a part of the same problem space. And I think it is accurate to describe securing these technologies as cybersecurity. In the past 25 years, these have been the software environments and IT uh, ecosystems where most vulnerabilities were being found. 
This is the top 10 organizations and software environments that had the most vulnerabilities according to SourceFire 25 years of vulnerability report. That's been our history. But the future of our industry is not going to be about information technology. It's going to be about new devices, devices, not PCs, not web servers, devices, watches, ATMs, insulin pumps, cars that are running these vulnerable software. And it's also going to be about all of this other stuff, radio frequency and global positioning system and aircraft control. And so this is a lot of different technologies coming together. The same stuff that allowed the University of Texas hackers to hijack the course of an $80 million yacht by changing the signaling of the position information that they were getting by sending out a spoofed positioning signal that was stronger than the one on the boat. They tricked the actual steersman, the actual kibernetas of the actual boat and sent it going someplace else. It's the same stuff that's letting people take control of insulin pumps. And yeah, cybersecurity is also about protecting a Bluetooth-enabled toilet. So, you know what, guys? There is not one single government, vendor, or any entity that can secure all of this different stuff. It's a complicated problem. But not only that, a lot of these vendors and governments are like, new shit has come to light, man. And we have got to stop and wrap our minds around this complicated problem. And they are somewhat correct, but you know what else? Some of this is old shit, connected in a new way. And the only reason it is coming to light in the first place is because hackers are exposing it and showing those vulnerabilities. So to quote the late Barnaby Jack, sometimes it just falls to us to demonstrate the threat so we can spark the solution. And I wholeheartedly agree. I think we have to keep looking at these new technologies because there is no better disinfectant than the light of day. If the hacker community makes a point of researching vulnerable technologies, whether they are Bluetooth enabled toilets, smart homes, cars, medical devices, we will make some change happen. And it is going to take a bottom up approach, not a top down solution decreed by one company or one regulator or one government. We got to research what matters in the words of Josh and Nick from I Am The Cavalry. Just one year ago, they stood, I think, in this very room, in fact, on a Sunday, right, telling hackers about why we have to start focusing our research and our efforts researching technologies that matter for protecting human life and public safety. And yesterday, after a year of activities, they've showed the progress that they have made with research into medical device security, automotive security, smart homes and infrastructures. And I encourage you to check out I Am The Cavalry and see what they are up to. But that's not the only way that you can make a difference. There are many different ways and I'm going to go into that in a second. I think I have to make a quick stop now. Hi guys. Oh, as I are. Okay. So, um, yes, I have a nice glass over there. <laughs> if you don't mind. No ice for me. Another way to contribute and uh, make positive things happen. Oh, wow, that's nice. So, this is a bottle of 12 uh, year old Glenfiddich single malt whiskey, I believe. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Because <laughs> that's how she rolls. True that, I did uh, kind of make a point mentioning to them that I am a single malt girl and that I do not drink bourbon, uh, Tennessee, or other types of whiskey. So, um, Build It Securely is a new project by uh, Zach Lanier, I believe, and Mark Stanislav. Did I get their names right? Uh, to offer Internet of Things security for people that are developing Internet of Things projects. So it's an easy way, if you're interested in Internet of Things, it's an easy way to get information on how to secure your project. And before I move on to the, to the next one, oh, thank you so much. It's really hard to get accepted to give a talk at DEF CON. Let's have a big round of applause for our first time speaker. Show the love. Thanks, Cheers. 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 
Thank you so much. Ron. Thank you. How's the talk going? Pretty well. Pretty well. They've laughed from all, all my jokes. This way? Really? Yeah, That's I think awesome. the jokes work, right? All right. Well, yeah. I'll check in with you later then. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers. Thank you, guys. I, I appreciated that I got a, a glass, right? On, because need, you got a yeah. long talk. It's a yeah, long. Yeah, I'm gonna talk. need some. There you go. Some right. Thank you. And the reason I only drink uh, single malt whiskey in a real glass is because you know it's spent 15 years in a barrel, then some time in a bottle. I just can't bear to put it in a plastic disposable cup. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> Bye guys. See you later. All right. On with the show. So the plot thickens. Even with the best intentions in mind, those governments and vendors are not going to be able to solve the problem. But guess what? Some of them don't have the best intentions in mind. In fact, there are huge resources at work actually keeping the world vulnerable. In the past year, we've all been perhaps shocked to learn exactly how much money the NSA has been spending on buying up vulnerabilities. Then we learned they even went as far as to pay a security company to include a deliberately weak random number generator and make it the default in one of their core encryption technologies. Now, a few months ago, as the OpenSSL hardblade vulnerability became known to the public, it was also alleged that the NSA had knowledge of this and exploited it for years. Now, that might not be true, but it is safe to assume that similar things have been going on. And so there is a little bit of a paradox at play here, because security agencies, security agencies have been making the world deliberately insecure. And that's part of the problem that we have got to be facing. But what's really making my own heart bleed, if you don't mind the pun, is stories like this, cover of Time magazine last month. I don't know if you read it. You probably haven't, but you've seen the headline, and it says, World War Zero, the global battle to steal your secrets, is turning hackers into arm dealers. Get it, guys? We are the arm dealers, not the government agencies, not the vendors, not the companies selling zero days to the highest bidder. And this really does break my heart a little bit, because I think a small group of people making a profit by selling zero days is painting all of us in a bad light. And so what's the solution to this? How can we avoid being the arm dealers? Well, I think we can start by not keeping our bugs to ourselves. I think we can start by trying to tip the scales and disrupt the zero-day vulnerability market. Yes, there will always be zero days. But if we can mine the same fields, if we can drain the swamp, if we can find the bugs before the bad guys do, we're going to make their life harder. And in fact, the reality is that never before have there been so many different avenues for hackers to disclose bugs and even get paid for them, right? We all know about bug bounty programs and competitions like Pwn to Own. There are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of new bug bounty programs out there by specific vendors. And I think that's just a fantastic thing that's happening. It's a great transformation in our industry. There's also uh, the Internet Bug Bounty Project, started by Katie Misuris and HackerOne, and I think that is a great avenue. Oh, hi. Uh, Katie's right there, by the way. Give her a hand, you know. <laughs> so things like the Internet Bug Bounty is a fantastic way to have an incentive for people to look at technologies and protocols that are maybe open source or not managed by a specific vendor and still get paid, and I think that's great. Google's announcement of their Project Zero also give us some uh, room for hope. But again, the problem thickens, the plot thickens, and it will need our help. There are a lot of companies and organizations that do not have bug bounty programs, that do not have disclosure policies. And the reason they can do that is because they can afford not to have that. They can sweep up the bugs under the carpet or ignore them or maybe pay a little to 
or maybe a lot, pay a lot to those companies selling the bugs quietly and never fix them. So we have to work that much harder. We have to keep researching vulnerabilities, disclosing them, and make it so that these companies and organizations cannot afford not to have a disclosure policy in place or a bug bounty program. Again, there is no better disinfectant than the light of day, and it is going to take a bottoms-up approach. And when I say bottoms-up, yeah. Thanks. So we don't have to be polite about disclosing vulnerabilities. We can start polite, and what if they don't listen? Well, there are exploit databases and the open source vulnerability database. But I see some of the faces here in the audience are still kind of like this. Not convinced, are you? Why should you care, right? You're just security professionals. You want to protect your own little piece of heaven from all the bad stuff that's out there. You want to be doing your stuff and not letting all the bad stuff touch you. Well, I want to tell you two more reasons and two more problems why I think each of us as a security professional needs to care about securing cyberspace as a whole and with a, as a big problem space with a lot of technologies. The first reason, which is third and overall, we are only as weak as our weakest link. That's not a mistake. We're not as strong as our weakest link. We are as weak as our weakest link. In the past year, we've all learned how you can be a retailer that's investing multiple, you know, have a multi-million dollar security program in place you will still get owned because your lame-ass refrigerator maintenance company out of Bumsville, wherever, didn't bother to put antivirus in place. You can be one of the world's leading security companies and develop the cutting-edge one-time password security token mechanism. But all it takes is one email, one spear phishing email to your parent company with one flash vulnerability embedded in an X file in an Excel file, sorry, not X files. I was a fan, you know, so still waiting for Mulder. Anyway, this is all it takes to implicate that multi billion dollar security company in the fact that the J22 model out of Chengdu, China, looks a lot like the F35 model made by Lockheed Martin. And so, it might be a question of time before one of your providers, your partners, your customers, your employees will mess it up and get you owned in the process. So you have to care about the security of other organizations and people that you are in touch with. But this problem also has another, another aspect to it. And that is that everybody is actually on the front lines. Guess what? There are no fierce cyber warriors defending the perimeter because there is really no perimeter. We are all a part of the same civilian cyberspace and we're all using the same infrastructure. And so, you know those people that say, oh, why should I bother securing my Facebook account or my PC? I'm not interesting, nobody is after me. Well, again, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And these are exactly the people and organizations and companies that don't bother enough and then their resources their digital assets, their cloud instances and social media profiles and email systems become just a launching pad for the next attack on you. Now, I'd like to move on because I think if we don't take the time to solve this problem, then we are all going to be, bar be part of a botnet or our machines are going to be part of a phishing campaign, launch spam, denial of service. You've all heard about these, uh, these problems. They're pervasive. So what can we do faced with the complicated nature of this problem? Well, you know, you could always join the Amish. That might work for some people. What's that, skull and bones? They have smartphones. Yeah, they now have smartphones as well. That's a good point. So maybe the Amish are not that safe anymore. Perhaps another approach then might be to start working together to start collaborating and not being shy about saying how exactly we were breached and what were our problems. Reaching out of your industry, your sector, your community. There are so many information sharing programs right now, threat intelligence programs. There are so many ways to share the technical and practical information about 
yeah, how you got owned so that the next guy doesn't. Now, I'm not saying you should be doing this for altruistic measures just because you like your, your competition. I'm saying you should be doing this, collaborating and sharing information because you're going to be attacked next and you're not going to know the malware is going to come at you unless you talk to your partners and, and your competitors at times. But where we are going to get, I think, the most bang for the buck, as it were, is by empowering the masses. Those shiny, happy people that don't think they have anything to hide, that nobody's looking at them, that nobody's interested in their devices, their machines, their credentials, etc. These are the people that we got to start talking to. And there are various ways to make that happen. One thing I like is crypto parties. These have been hugely popular in Europe. There have been hundreds of them all over Germany. And there is a wiki and a how-to to throw a crypto party in your hometown. And what it is, is basically a community event where you teach basic security, privacy, and cryptography measures to regular people. But you don't just teach them, you actually configure the stuff on their devices. So maybe, maybe they can learn how to use PGP. I know it's a bit hard. Another way is to be supporting the policy organizations that are changing public opinion, that are raising awareness, but also challenging and renegotiating the terms of engagement with governments, civilians, and the technologies in between. Now, I'd like to tell you about something pretty cool that uh, we actually did back home in Tel Aviv, which is a little bit out of the box, I think. Uh, we called it the Red Cyber Team, and this was a group of volunteers Maybe one of them is even here today. Matan, are you around? All right, he's hiding. So this was a group of volunteers, people who are pen testers, and in their day job, they do security assessments. And we brought them together, or they brought themselves together, rather. And in the course of a few afternoons, maybe a month or two, they visited a local hospital outside Tel Aviv that didn't really have any budget or awareness of security issues at all. After they went in, showed the hospital management exactly what they could do, that turned things around, and that got that organization to pay attention to security. Now, they did follow a code of ethics when they did what they did, but in the end, they didn't get paid. They only got a pretty cool hat and the feeling that they did something good. Now, I'd like to offer you a way to earn some bonus points, as it were, in the effort to make the world a better place. I know that sounds kind of... Corny. Cisco estimates that we're going, to get, we're going to need one million more security professionals in the coming years. Now, it's time we started procreating. It's time that we, as an industry, yeah, right? It's time that we, as an industry, began propagating and making more security professionals out there. You can do this by reaching out to someone, becoming a mentor, uh, creating entry-level positions in your company or organization, by talking to people. Something I do a lot is go speak with computer science and engineering students in high schools and colleges. And I just tell them what they can do in the cybersecurity industry. And they seem pretty excited, and I hope many of them become security professionals. Now, you can not do anything about this, and guess what? There will be one more one million more security professionals because the market is going to need them. They're just not going to be as qualified as you guys would like them to be. So that should be an incentive to start reaching out now. Overall, what I'm suggesting is that we empower these shiny, happy people to be a bit more like us, right? To be armed to the teeth, to be there with us on the front lines. Because they're only going to be as secure as we help them become. And if we don't, they're going to drag us down. So that's one way, or actually I already described a couple of ways you can do good things. But to kind of wrap things up, I'd like to ask you, who here knows what has been a phenomena causing power outages in the United States that's also stopped the trading on NASDAQ twice in the past 20 years? I'm sure somebody can guess. That's right, it is the squirrels, and you guys, you guys know your stuff. But for those who don't, in a pretty extensive survey the New York Times did last summer, they found out that squirrels munching on power lines, I mean the actual vermin, the actual animals eating power cables, were the cause of a lot of power outages. 
This was actually mentioned here at DEF CON by, I believe, Jericho from Attrition a couple of years ago. Yet, we don't see billions of dollars being poured at persistent squirrel preventive technologies. <laughs> a mystery, right? Well, this is because the FUD of cyber has taken over. Now, we can raise our hands and say, oh, kids, get off my lawn. Or we can try and change this. For those of you not familiar with the term FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This has been actually, it was originally developed as a scare tactic by IBM salespeople in the 70s. And they wanted to prevent a competitor from selling technology to their customers. So they told them, there's no telling what's going to happen if you buy that stuff. But today, FUD is being used to funnel billions of dollars into government agencies and military work to develop cutting-edge cybersecurity, defensive and offensive technology that's simply not going to help the everyday people. So the public is being kept in constant fear of some vague, digital, pixelated apocalypse which is right around the corner, right? Have you heard about the digital Pearl Harbor, cyber Pearl Harbor, that kind of stuff. Well, that kind of stuff keeps it vague, it keeps it scary, it keeps it in the hands of governments and militaries. Where actually, where I believe most of the problems are, are in the civilian cyberspace, with regular people and regular companies, not the militarized, weaponized stuff. So how can we stop the spread of FUD? Well, you can fight FUD with facts. You can seek the truth out for yourself. And when somebody uses a vague term like millions of cyber attacks are being stopped each day, ask them millions of what? Millions of packets? Millions of port scans? Millions of infected devices communicating with the CNC server? Be concrete with the terms. You know, in, in biology, we can hear about the 10 million microbes living in this bottle, yet people don't get sick all the time. We gotta be using concrete terms that have relevance to our industry, to our field. And it's easy to go up to those high numbers, billions of cyber attacks when you're counting microbes in effect. Now, once we seek out that information for ourselves, when we seek the truth behind the FUD, and I think that is something this industry or this community is very good at doing because, you know, raise your hands if you're allergic to bullshit, right? That is, a, a, I believe, a defining characteristic of our community. And it's good. It's good to have that. But it is also important not just be allergic to bullshit and have that knee-jerk reaction, but also to seek out the actual information on what is really happening. And then once you know what's up, communicate that outbounds, communicate it outside of our community. There is a gap between us, a gap between the hacker world and the rest of them. And we have to be mindful of that gap and keep reaching out and telling people what it's like so they are not thwarted by the fog of FUD. Now, the problem of FUD flows both ways because certain governments, certain agencies, certain decision makers, if you pardon my French, they eat where they shit. That means they are also feeding the public with the same fat that they are being fed. Wow, those are a lot of Fs. Hold on, I need a drink. Yikes. All right. So they are being fed with the same fat that they are spreading. Now, you know how they say there is no patch for human stupidity? That is actually not accurate because if we expect that the decision-making people and the decision-making algorithms are not going to change, we can still influence the input. We can still make sure that the information that the decision-makers are getting and the way that they are treating these issues that will matter to everybody are concrete, honest, not laced with fud and bullshit and hyperbola, but realistic. And again, I think the guys at I Am The Cavalry have been doing so many meetings with Congress people, etc. And you can do the same thing in your own communities and in your own countries even. So, to kind of wrap things up, I think the internet needs you not to grow cool facial hair, but rather to save it for the future. And there are five things that we can all start doing right now. 
And you know what's the cool thing about it? We don't need to ask for permission. We are hackers. We can do whatever we like. We don't need the key. We'll break in, right? So to summarize, we can be researching the technologies that affect human life and public safety. We can be researching stuff that matters. We have to, you know, disclose more bugs, find more vulnerabilities, get the information out there one way or another. We can collaborate and share within our industry, our community, but also outside of it. And we can empower the masses so that those happy, shiny Lego people are going to have red mohawks. And, of course, stop the spread of FUD, which is something everyone can do, just like sanitizing your hands with alcohol to stop the spread of microbes. Now, let's reflect on everything I told you. I claim that governments will fail to a certain extent to secure cyberspace, that big problem space, for the rest of us. We can argue about how big the failure will be, how epic, about the extent of it. We can argue about what are we going to do about it. But one thing I, I don't think we can argue about is can we afford not to do anything right now? And so, yeah, we can use our powers to read people's emails, and that's fun. I've done that. But we can also use our power to be this guy and save the world. Or maybe more like this guy if you're a cyberpunk fan like myself. Now, yeah, you can call me innocent, naive, adorable, as some people have been known to do. You can say that I am a romantic hacker that expects things that are not reasonable. But I grew up with my little ponies, but also with hackers and gadgets and robots. And I'm excited to see the science fiction technologies I imagined becoming a reality. And I think in that reality, hacking is magic and it can save the world. Thank you, guys. Wow, oh, that's overwhelming. Thank you, guys. You're too kind. Guys and girls, I might add. This year, I've seen more ladies at DEF CON than ever. And yeah, keep coming here, ladies. And, and so let me know what do you choose to do, red pill or blue pill, part of the problem or part of the solution. And you can easily find me on Twitter or the interwebs, and you can also Send me multicolored ponies if you think that I am naive and romantic. But I hope you join this and become part of the solution. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we may have a minute or a couple for questions. I missed all of the hand waving and the signaling that the goons were supposed to be sending my way. That might have something to do with the whiskey. Uh, okay, I see a guy over there. Yeah, hiya. Okay, so I don't think you're naive. That's cool. What areas are you personally addressing within the hero process of what it is that you would want to see or have done? Specifically, what's happening right now over in your own country? Okay, uh, so actually specifically with what's happening right now in my country, that's a good question. So I actually have a story to reply with that. Let's see if I can bring that up. All right, anyone know what that is? Iron Dome, that's right. That is Iron Dome, the missile defense system that's been uh, intercepting rockets fired at civilian population in Israel. Now, don't worry, this is not going to be political. Uh, two weeks ago, Brian Krebs broke a story about how some of the defense companies uh, Israeli defense companies developing Iron Dome had been breached by Chinese hackers. Uh, the story made the rounds. It got on BBC, a Business Insider, Guardian, a bunch of others. And the headlines started to, to devolve. And by the time they got into you know, Israeli media, the headlines read, Iron Dome needs a cyber Iron Dome. Now, as I was getting ready to come out here to DEF CON, I went to see my hairdresser. Obviously an important person in my life, right? And he was like, uh, Karen, I know you're in the cybersecurity stuff. What's going on? Are the Chinese hackers now controlling the rockets over our heads? 
And what I do when I'm faced with that sort of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, I go back to the media, I go back to people that I'm in touch with, Tel Aviv University and other people in Israel, and I tell them, listen, let's get the facts right. What actually happened is that several companies that had something to do with the development of Iron Dome did experience a breach. And those companies responded that the breach happened three years ago and it had some classified documents leaked out to potentially maybe Chinese hackers affiliated with the now notorious uh, advanced Pacific threat, uh, unit 61389. But there wasn't anything about Iron Dome specifically in it, and it does not mean that some guy sitting in Shanghai can now control the rockets here in Tel Aviv. So let's get that straight. And so to answer your question, sir, one thing I do a lot is talk to people like that. I go to the media, I talk to the public, I go to TED, and I tell people what it's really like and what it means when a security researcher publishes a vulnerability, and I try to get the facts for myself so that I can communicate them outside. Yes, a question right here. I'm not seeing you guys, so if you have a question, like, wave really profusely. You guy, you, and then one guy over the back. Yeah. How do we get more women in security? That is a fantastic question. I actually, uh, one of the panels that I submitted to DEF CON was about this, but it was rejected. Never mind, I got over it. Uh, not bitter at all, no. So <laughs> I think one way is by creating accessible role models. Like for me, it was Angelina Jolie, but <laughs> for other people, it might be different women. And I think it's critical that we get more speakers at conferences, at panels, and that we talk not just about technical stuff, but also about you know, our specific career paths. I speak to girls who are learning uh, computer science back in Israel all the time. And I just tell them how I got started, what's the security industry like, is it true that there are only boys at DEF CON? No, I tell them it is not true. And every year that I've been coming, I've been seeing more women of all shapes, sizes, ages, ethnicities, I tell them that. And I think it's a good question too because we are going to need, you know, that 50% of the potential workforce. So my response would be accessible role models and, you know, getting more, more of that out. But there's another side to that and that's something you guys can do. You know, there are black hats, white hats. Don't be a douche hat, you know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was a guy over there in the back. Yeah. Yell. Okay, so the question was that in academia, a lot of the discussion is focused on the military stuff, military side of things, and not enough on the civilian side and the civilian role and how cybersecurity matters to civilian society and how we, can we counter that. So one thing uh, that I am a big believer in is having always that one leg in academia. I'm a research fellow with Tel Aviv University and I constantly talk about this stuff. I talk about things like anonymous. I talk about things like private individuals who are making a difference in the security industry. I talk about the role of, you know, ISPs, right? ISPs, I don't know, here in the United States it might be different, but in Israel I think that the telcos and the ISPs and the civilian companies are not doing enough, and I keep saying that. I keep saying that every forum that I get, every place that I get, in university, outside of university. Uh, I'm also kind of uh, using the university as a, almost like a, a back door in a way. Don't tell them, right? Uh, but, but I'm using that to influence public opinion because the university does events where the prime minister comes down, right? The Israeli prime minister. And I try to make sure that at those events, the content and the questions about not just military and strategic cyber warfare stuff, but also practical cyber security issues that matter to everybody are also raised. Uh, all right, guys, I think that's about all the One more. time we have. One more question, please. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, it's over here? Yeah. Um, do you think it's time for us to take back the word hacker 
that it's not cyber criminal, it's not attacker, it's not script kiddies, and when someone says a hacker did it or a hacker did that, we need to stop them and say, no, that's a criminal or that's a nation state actor and be more specific than just say, oh, hacker, which is lazy. Mm. Uh, okay, so personally I have to say I have been always proud to use the term hacker. I've been proud to say I've been a hacker. I'm part of the hacker community. I never thought it was a negative thing. I always, always thought it was actually a badge of honor. Honestly, I think that the term hacker implies capability. It implies intuition. It implies curiosity. And then what it all comes down to is the actual individual choices that hacker makes. Whether they choose to become a cyber warrior defending their nation, uh, whether they become a cyber criminal, whether they become a hacktivist, those are different sort of career paths that they can choose. Personally, I think it's important to use the term hacker in every opportunity we get. Uh, my first line, my first sentence in my TED talk was, a security researcher did that, otherwise known as a hacker, right? I, I put the word security researcher and hacker together to make it clear that this is the sort of thing that's being done by hackers and it's a good thing. Uh, each of us has to make their own decisions about how they are proud or how they want to represent themselves. But, but by, by being good hackers, in a way, I know that sounds like really Care Bear stuff, right? But, uh, you know, I like the Care Bears. They're cool. Um, by being a good hacker, we can redeem that image and we can say, yeah, hackers did that and that's pretty cool. And you know, hackers also brought back uh, internet connectivity to Egyptian dissidents in the Arab Spring and they also helped Syrians. And they are also exposing problems in medical devices that are life-threatening. So thank God we have hackers, right? That's what I believe in. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. It is incredibly, incredibly rewarding and, and humbling and overwhelming to be able to address you guys and girls here. So rock on. Hack the planet. Yeah. Woo!